Hello and welcome to Voices of the West. Today we have the honor of talking to Frank Kelso, author of the Apprentice series and the Jeb and Zach series and at least about a dozen some odd books out there. Frank, welcome and uh, tell us a little about yourself. Well, I am a, uh, an, an author of, of long standing, but I, I didn't write to publish in common literature, I wrote grants for a living. Oh, I had a research center at the Atlanta VA here, and uh, I would write a grant. And actually, it's writing those grants that made me a better writer for authors and books. Uh, I would submit my grants to a review board, and they that was they were like a critique group. I didn't send it back. Said, well, you didn't explain how you're going to do this, and you didn't explain how you're going to do that. And a lot of of people in the grant business would get their nose out of joint. Well, those dummies didn't understand what I was doing. Well, I would say, oh, I didn't make that clear enough, and I'd resubmit that grant after I made the corrections they suggested. And pretty soon, I was getting sixty percent of my grants approved overall Excellent. and uh, i was had a, a pretty good research center going and i didn't even think about it at the time that that was my critique group and uh i'd listen to what they say and, and i said you didn't explain this or how did you get from you know a to c and i really valued having a critique group, somebody who would come say, well, I, I didn't understand why you did this. And I think it had an impact in my writing so that I like that feedback I got from people, uh, even if they're editors or, or proofreaders or whatever, uh, really helped me tune my writing to, to where um, I thought it was uh, more publishable in the general arena rather than in the funding arena. And believe me, there's a big difference to writing uh, an application for grant funding than writing a novel. <laughs> Although I was frequently accused of science fiction in my some of my research applications. <laughs> well, that's always good too. Well, what got you from the transition from writing for medical grants and such like that into Westerns? Uh, well, uh, Roger Williams had an old song. So one of the lines was, Kansas City stars, what I are. And uh, I grew up in Kansas City. And as a kid, we went to all of the Western sites, you know, pretended to be cowboys and Indians. The, the Santa Fe Trail started there. And, and there were just numerous sites there. And one of the favorite places that I go was McAfee Stage Station. Uh, that was the, about the second stop on the Santa Fe Trail. And it's still there. And uh, you could go visit, and they still run a stage up, you know, around the farm. And uh, it was a big thing for us kids to do in those days. I always remembered I always had a good time out there. And, and uh, uh, as I got older and had kids, why we'd go back to visit Kansas City, I'd take them to see all this. And the kids, you know, would, would pull in my chain and said, Did you have to fight the Indians when you went to grade school, Dad? <laughs> And I said, no, that wasn't quite that long ago. They have a good way of doing that to us, don't they? <laughs> yeah. So what do you feel makes a great Western? I like to take something that actually happened in the West and write a story about it. Just to make something up out of the blue is difficult for me. Uh, I take something that happened and I put my character in that situation and let him work it through. I don't change history. I just put him where history was going on. And um, one of the problems I have with writing pure cowboy stories, that is a, a, a guy who actually rides a horse to take cow cows, uh, he's got no excuse to go any place but the ranch he works at. So I tried to get my characters to have a, a, a legitimate reason be going someplace and and my first book there was a mule train the mule train went from place to place across the west and he had an excuse for going there and uh, 
to me, that gave the stories a, a, a thread and a foundation of, okay, we're going to go to uh, Fort St. Bran in Colorado, which still exists. And uh, it was an old time fur trading post. And today it's just a, 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 a suburb of Denver. A lot of those that seem to pop up that way, that if you went back in time, they would be uh, basically a bunch of sticks set up with a tent over the top. And now there are like full cities attached to other cities. <laughs> yep. How do you feel that a Western is best promoted? Uh, Trying to sell to today's audience, which allegedly isn't into Westerns, although we sell enough that probably I think they actually do like them, but. <laughs> the the interesting thing is i think i'm writing for for male cowboys and facebook lets me know that 60 percent of my readers are females and uh, my whole reading whole, uh audience out there is over 60. so all of us old gray-haired folks uh come by that honestly and and recognize you know that yeah, things were different back then. <laughs> oh, our our market data also says that about 50% or 60% of our readership is also women as well. So there's definitely a very solid market going on there for Westerns for ladies. Yep. Yeah. And one of the things that it's taken me a while to recognize, um, the traditional Hoplong Cassidy type cowboy uh he might rescue the woman but that, that was you know he never kissed her never anything else and trying to bring in that balance of why the women were important in the west and why the the, the men were generally sheltering the women um uh, because it was a tough life for a woman out there and uh if if you wanted to keep a woman around you better do a little something to protect her. And that's why so many of the stories, you know, the, somebody did something wrong to the woman and all of a sudden he's got all kinds of trouble from all his neighbors and everybody else. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> what do you think is the most underexposed and underdeveloped part of the Old West? I'm sorry, say the question again. Uh, what would you feel, what do you think is the most underexposed or underdeveloped part of the Old West in terms of storytelling? What stories need to be told but aren't? Yeah. Uh, I think that the, the West has a, uh, the Old West has a, a bad rep for not being tolerant of um, minorities, uh, even the Indians. I mean, they didn't didn't like the Indians. I think our country has a lot to be ashamed of for the way we handle the American West and, and actually did biological warfare, uh, moving smallpox around and, and cholera around as they needed it. But uh, I try and not get too political in that other than this happened and there was a reason why it happened. And it may have not been the most politically correct reason, but it was what the reason why it happened. And uh, uh, the the old saw about those that don't know their history are de determined to repeat it. Uh, I hope we could avoid repeating a lot of the mistakes he made in the old West. We didn't handle what, how we work with uh, American Indians at the all. And uh, our relationship with Mexico was, was often uh, warfare. Warfare and see how much of each side you could steal from each other and yeah. yeah. Yep, I'm going that's, cattle that's war. One of my series that, that that's they're on the Rio Grande and they, they they cross the border to, you know, yeah, back and forth to keep taking from the other person whoever took from you and yep, standard feud kind of material going on there. Unfortunately, <laughs> uh, the it's and it's the same reason. Mm -hmm. We have more than we they do, and they want some. And that, that's the, the, been the attitude for a lot of people back in the old West. They have something I don't have, and I'm going to go take it from them. Yeah. And borders get shifted and everything around, around like that to try and show whoever is strongest gets to have all the stuff. Yep. 
Yeah. In your bio online, it was speaking that you had a tradition of storytelling around the house with your parents. I'd like to hear more about that because you don't hear much about real modern day storytellers anymore in the traditional sense. Yep. Uh, my father and, and mother were physicians and they had a large group of, of friends uh, with different ethnic background and therefore gave them a chance to, to, to talk to different people about different things. It wasn't always about medicine. And uh, there was always some storyline going on. And if I could keep the Western vein for a moment, uh, dad would, would, was active in, in a number of community affairs. And he went to the Mulebach Hotel in old Kansas City at the time was, was the, the kind of the center of, of civic activity. And Gene Autry was in town. Um, and this is back probably 46, 47, something in that time. And Gene Autry was still a big draw. And uh, dad knew the stage manager back there, and he went in to see the guy and, and uh, said hello to Gene. And, and uh, they, Smiley Burnett was there and uh, had three women who were singing trio. And something came up, and, and uh, they said they would love to get out of the hotel and do something. They weren't used to traveling and staying in a hotel and you know it was downstairs to, to, to go to the show and back up your hotel room and dad said well let's go to my house tonight and i'll you know give you all dinner so they came out and gene even came along he stayed about half an hour and uh after dinner dad had a, uh, a saying about you know if you don't clean your plate you're going to get your vegetables in the morning and he'd say that to us kids. And he said to those young ladies from California, and uh, our cook would make a wonderful pancake, uh, a corn cake, and, and it had kernel corn in it. And so the next morning came down and she served those because it was always a treat for visitors. And the one girl turned to the other and says, my God, he really did put the vegetables in the pancake. <laughs> They were warned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and mom and Smiley Burnett got to be good friends. And uh, every time she'd go out to Los Angeles, she'd go visit Smiley when he was on the scene of uh, what was Petticoat Junction or something like mm -hmm. that. So uh, that was amazing how that, you know, you meet people and all of a sudden you make real friends out of them. And Smiley was just the same character you saw on the screen was the same character that he was. I mean, he was he was not a, a Hollywood creation. He was just Smiley Burnett. <laughs> it's always nice to meet real people who actually, yes. actors who are willing to be down to earth to other people. That is a wonderful thing. When it comes to writing a book, what comes first for you, the plot or the characters? Uh, actually, the ending. Ah, yes. I have to know what happens and the climax to the character that makes it the whole story worthwhile. And if if you can't have, you know, from my point of view, if you don't know where you're going, you know, how are you going to get there? I know where we're going to end, and the story is leading to it, and it makes it much easier to write. I, I, something comes in, I say, wouldn't that be a neat way to end a story? And, and I go from there. I actually write the story backwards. I know how I want it to end, and I know the path I have to travel to get there. Well, keeps you on track the whole time if you see where the ending is, definitely. What kind of Western have you long dreamed about writing? Well, actually, I'd like to, to, to think I'm I'm working on one now. I've got about four books outlined in a series, and the name of the series is After Tombstone. Ah. It didn't end at Tombstone. That, oh, we've got the whole vendetta uh, ride that comes after that. Right. And, it, and Doc went back to Las Vegas in Mexico, and... That was the last place he had a dentist office. He had he, he closed it before he went to Tombstone, but he came back. He he liked that area, and, and uh, Bat Masterson was there, 
and they were they the railroad the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad paid Matt Matterson Masterson to to keep the uh, uh, Santa Fe uh, the uh, Atchison the Peak and Santa Fe Road open so he could run a, a train line up the Royal Gorge to Leadville and there was more lead not, not lead silver and, and gold up there uh they thought the the silver kind of appeared to collapse and what they found was there was gold underneath <laughs> <laughs> so it stayed popular for a long time so so Wyatt after Tombstone went to California he came back to Leadville uh Doc was helping Bat Batches and keep the thing settled down below the hill Doc went up the hill and and uh got into gambling and he ended up winning a pretty good sized gold mine and he gave it to Doc I mean to Wyatt and he says I'm not going to be around long of this and this is true I'm not making this up mm -hmm. and Wyatt's woman that the one he took from the, he followed from Tucson out to California she said oh you don't want a gold mine and and she sold it and Doc got really mad at him and he told him he said you know hey I I was trying to look out for you and and you sold what I gave you you know what kind of deal is this and so Doc got real mad at at Doc I'm to get, to get much character straight Doc got mad at Wyatt and they kind of were at odds for a while down at Gunniston, Colorado. And if you go to Gunniston now, there's nothing there but a big lake. The, down to the bottom of that lake was where the gold mines were. <laughs> and uh, uh, Doc stayed there till he got um, his tuberculosis and, and his self-medication got him into real trouble. And they took him and I've I've, gone out and hiked this trail and i can't imagine doing that they had a stagecoach that ran from gunnison colorado if you know where that is up across the the, the backbone of the rockies it went through uh south park where there's a big gold mine at south park and then on up over the hill and came out to a skeet area before you got to the colorado river and downstream about another 15 miles was Colorado Springs where Doc ended up in the sanitarium. And they took a stagecoach up across those, the, the backbone of the Rockies, uh, down to the Colorado River and then down to uh, Colorado Springs where Doc finally died. But while all that was going on, the sheriff back in Tombstone was still mad at Wyatt for A, stealing his girl, that was who he went to California with, and B, shooting up everything and leaving them with <laughs> nothing when, when he got through. And so he tried to get Wyatt, but Wyatt was, was a U.S. Marshal, so he couldn't bring any charges against him. So he bought charges against Doc because he, Wyatt and Doc were good buddies. And he said, well, I'll make trouble for Wyatt, which is making trouble for for." for uh, you know, get my characters straight. Yes. <laughs> I'm making trouble for Doc. Uh, we'll get it, Wyatt. Mm -hmm. And so that's where Bat Matcherson got involved again. He was liked by the Colorado. Uh, Colorado was newly formed at that time. It had been a territory and just formed up to state. And the governor liked uh, Bat Masterson. And so Bat went to the governor and said, don't extradite holiday you know find some excuse but don't don't fall for it but the arizona marshals or rangers i think they were came up twice to try and get doc you know the old-fashioned way grab him and get out of town <laughs> and uh so there, there, there were two gunfights one of them was outside of gunniston and it's kind of an interesting because in in real life after the the fight at Gunniston some newspaper guy could come to town trying to find out what was going on and he says I don't know why you're trying to find Wyatt and Doc he says you ought to talk to Bat he's the biggest gunman around well it was it was all puffery and they were just <laughs> pulling this guy's leg and Bat got real mad at him he says hey listen I can go places do things and people don't bother me you guys get telling these kind of stories he says I'm gonna have everybody in the west shooting at me <laughs> and so it's those are the kind of stories that I like to take the real life 
Mm -hmm. and, and we don't talk about him much because, you know, okay, so so Bat got upset and he left town. Uh, but at least I'm writing this, trying to write a story that brings these characters to life where they're not just shooting somebody. They, they're actually trying to, in this case, trying to keep Doc from getting extradited back to Arizona where they're hanging. So that that's the kind of thing I like to do. I like to take real events and make stories around them. Indeed. That sounds like a tremendously fun book. It's got all of the major players that everybody likes to see. Well, you've got Holiday and you've got uh, Bat Masterson in there, which are two of my absolute favorites. And, you know, everybody loves Wyatt. So, yeah, <laughs> and, sounds and, like a very good one. Good series to get out. Yep. And uh, I've even got three of the, the, the titles worked out was Gunfight at Gunniston and, and uh, the last book is Return to Dodge. They all went back. You've probably seen the famous picture of the the uh, Dodge Police Commission. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. As, as Wyatt and Bat and uh, a guy by the name of Luke Short, mm -hmm. uh, Bill Tigman. And I'm, oh, the other guy in the picture is a ringer. He was the guy who owned the saloon that was paying for all of it. <laughs> he hired the photographer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. One of the most famous photos of the Old West with some of the greatest characters that ever existed in it. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. that that sounds like a fabulous series. I'd love to read that when it comes out. Yep. Yeah, that's the kind of stuff uh, you wonder what guys do. I spend all my time on, on the Internet digging up these remote facts. I don't know what we did before we had the internet. I know my my dad used to go around to different places hunting up libraries so he could find out things. And I've done that a few times when I'd go out. Uh, one summer when I first retired the first time, uh, we put a little over 6,000 miles on the car doing the blue highway. It's going up and down the back road, stopping to places, visiting little libraries and talking to people. I was just trying to get the rhythm of how people talked and, and mm -hmm. how they reacted to things. And just, you know, I wasn't looking for anything particular. I just wanted to visit places and talk to people and find out how they looked at things. And and uh, one place I, I, I visited always struck me was, was uh, in east western Oklahoma, not the Panhandle, but the, as, a, as a state park there, Fort. Uh, FOSS, F-O-S-S, -S, State Park. And I talked to a guy there that was the fourth generation farmer, rancher on that land that was next to the park. And uh, he admitted that working for the park was what kept him, that kept the money coming in because he wasn't making enough money farming <laughs> to do otherwise. But talk to somebody that's lived on that same spot for three to four generations. It's just amazing. I mean, he talked about the, 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 the they still have buffalo at, at uh, the state park there. And and uh, what it was like to try and farm in that, or uh, ranch, I shouldn't say farm, ranch in that area. They, they had been moving cattle for, you know, 90 years. And it's just unbelievable to think that, you know, that that's a tough way to make a living. Yeah, absolutely. That's long, long hours, long miles, and you don't usually come out of riding that much in uh, very good shape to walk. Yep. <laughs> How do you feel the Western market is changing? Well, I'm, I don't think it's changed all that much of, uh, your basic story is still a guy's something, somebody's been wronged and somebody's either tried to straighten it out or, or, or to prevent it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, well, we laugh about it. Uh, the Jack Reacher series uh, is an example of a modern Western. He travels right. around on a Greyhound bus. And he sees something going wrong and he steps in and stops it. And isn't that what the old cowboy stories did? And so Lee Child just writes a, a modern version of a cowboy who rides the Greyhound. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very much so. Yes, you're right. Hadn't really thought of it that way, but yes, I 
love the Reacher series on that. I'm looking forward to the new one coming out. But yeah. Yeah, it's very much a modern day cowboy, gunslinger, everything like that coming into town. Yep. Yeah. So wh where can we find mo out more about your books? And if, if someone were to take all dozen books of yours, where would you have them start reading if they wanted to get familiar with your work? Uh, the Apprentice series is a coming of age story. And in coming of age, you, you've got to stay with the younger version of the guy for a while before you, before he grows up, but you see how they grow up. So it's kind of the making of, of, of a, a more uh, mountain man than a cowboy. Uh, but by uh, uh, California Bound series is, to me, a, a traditional Western. It was set in Eagle Pass, Texas. And it was after the Civil War uh, ended. And both Texas and Mexico were having a hard time at the time. Uh, Mexico had a Civil War just starting and the U.S. had a Civil War just ending. And uh, to me, that is is kind of the, the, the place cowboy began uh, after the Civil War. Uh, Texas changed, the whole area changed, the the, the Civil War, the, the, the types of weapons changed. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, it affected the whole West. And as the West, particularly Texas, restored after the Civil War and began to generate money, it changed the whole Western. Of course, the, the gold in California and, and uh, Colorado certainly changed things in that area, in the mountain area. But Texas, uh, after the Civil War, the cattle started coming into its own. And then when the railroads came, it just all took off. Yeah, absolutely. That and then discovery of oil and everything like that. And things flooded in from all over the place. Yep. Absolutely. So where does one buy your books? I'm sorry. Say again. Where can where can someone buy the, buy your books? Well, I to me there's escapism. It gives you a chance to visit another time. I think I say that on my my uh, uh, little business card is, is is stories to transport you to another time and place. Uh, there, you you can go back and relive that time when when. A man was a man and, and did what he had to do. And that's kind of the way I look at, at life in general. Either you stand up and do what you got to do or you fade away. Absolutely. And that was the entire Western movement was all about individualism and trying to overcome the frontier, yeah. the elements, the Indians, the whatever else seemed to come and face you at any given time and then followed up by the rest of society coming chasing after them. <laughs> yeah. Which I think is why we find it a still a great period to be able to have stories in, because it was all about change. Sort of like today is of change, but it was just different then, because you had a more ability to shape your future as opposed to now. It seems like everything's already filled up. Yeah, I was just uh, resetting the volume on my. Oh, no worries. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I tend to talk oh. too fast at certain points like that. <laughs> so you're available on Amazon and yes. I know you have a variety of you have a number of novels going through here at least just shy a dozen of them and you have a whole bunch of different short stories as well it looks like yes yes uh actually I started writing short stories first uh, more as an exercise to to, to, to get to writing a full length novel that's a little different uh but the the guys in my critique group tease me about my short stories. They titled them "Everybody Dies," because <laughs> in those in those books, everybody did die. I mean, they they were stories of, of life was hard and it got harder. Yeah, George R. R. Martin made him a couple million dollars doing that type of a thing. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, no, that and and I like the short stories overall. Um, to me, they're character studies. Mm -hmm. I pick a character and, and, and I could really get in depth of that character and I don't worry about 
character growth and all this other stuff you have to worry about in a novel. Uh, you know, he is what he is, and he either, you know, survives doing what he's doing or he doesn't. And and it was a, a, just a character study of how things can happen and how you handle the what happens to you. Do you give up or do you keep going or you get tougher or, or you roll over and die? Absolutely. Yeah, we've got uh, we've got a short story anthology starting up that uh, basically all bounty hunters and doing short little vignettes on bounty 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 hunting. I can't speak. <laughs> So yeah, it definitely is all very good stuff to be able to get out there and write. Well, thank you for spending time with me today. We're getting a little short on what Zoom's going to allow me to keep on talking here, but I uh, appreciate you coming along and sharing with us and discussing some of what you find on Westerns, and hopefully people can come out and find a lot of your books and get started and hooked on you as well. Yep. Well, I appreciate you asking me to ramble for a while. Do you get us old guys talking? We'll just keep on going. Oh, my pleasure. And I'm definitely looking forward to the uh, book with White and Doc and, and Bat coming out, because that's definitely right up my alley on everything. Yeah, I've got four books outlined in that, so I've got to get busy. Outstanding. I look forward to those coming out. All righty. Thank, right, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>